Hello there, Lisa Fitzgibbon here from Project 7 and welcome to our check-in service. So this is where we're going to hook up with our previous headline producers and our alumni from all around the world. We're going to find out where you are, what you're doing, what you're working on, how you're doing it, that kind of thing. Anyone who's been to one of our Project 7 events knows what an intensely challenging and rewarding week it can be where forever friendships are made and creative connections that last are created. And uh, this is the check-in service. So we're going to try and put everyone together so we can hook you up with your Project 7 kin. And today we're checking in with producer, mixer, songwriter, engineer, programmer, multi-instrumentalist and Project 7 headline producer, Gethin Pearson. Based in Wales, Gethin's production crosses musical continents from rock all the way to hip-hop with death-defying ease. Anyone who's had the privilege of working with Gethin knows how incredibly enthusiastic he is about the art of making music. His ability to carefully nurture the artist whilst taking risks is the reason why he produces the quality and the quantity of output that he does. Gethin's writing and production credits include Mercury Prize winning Badly Drawn Boy, Maverick grunge electro pop diva Charlie XEX, Killy from Block Party and Crystal Fighters, just to name a few. Gethin is a gifted songwriter producer, always putting the experience of the artist at the forefront of his creative process. Hello, Gethin Pearson. It's Lisa Fitz checking in. How are you? Hey, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Your smiling Very face. Nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in so my window us, of this room. <laughs> so, Gethin, what are you working on at the moment? Tell me what you're up to. Well, at the moment, so at the start of the year, I uh, picked up a record with a band called Wen Young. So we've been working together, um, really, really great band. We started in January, been doing like a few weeks on, a few weeks off. Obviously, that's kind of like paused at the moment with uh, everything that's going on. So we're, we're working remotely at the moment, like sending ideas back and forth kind of doing pre-pro ready for when we can get back in the studio. So that's cool. I've been doing um, a lot of writing sessions over Skype. So I've really? been working with, yeah, yeah. It's been really, it's really, really fun actually. It's kind of been working with this great Norwegian artist and um, we're kind of like setting up in the morning, having a chat over coffee, kind of starting some ideas. I'll, I'll create a few music loops, send them over and she'll literally record the, what we've like kind of come up with quickly onto a voice note on her phone, send me the voice note, I put it into the session. We've been doing like, yeah, we've, and the demos are sounding really good just from doing that. So it's kind of, until we can get into a studio to actually, you know, make it, we, we're just trying to make do with just as much as we can do this way, really. Yeah, and doing a bunch of mixing as well. I've got a few, a record I'm in the middle of mixing, a few EPs I'm mixing. So, yeah, but once I'm in this room, it's no different to a... Uh, to every other day of life but I kind of once this you know once we knew we were going to be on lockdown for a while I kind of had to make sure that I scheduled in some Skype stuff with people or FaceTime whatever ways to still have that kind of creative interaction because I know that if I've got to spend a lot of time just mixing like on my own in this room like my headspace doesn't always stay great (laughs) type of thing so it's kind of so I you know once I knew so I put like a shout out actually on Instagram saying, oh, anyone want to do some writing or, you know, chat about songs or, and I, yeah, the message was quite crazy. I had quite a lot coming back. So it was just like me and my uh, manager, Kat, then were just like scheduling out the next few weeks of like trying to break it up so that I could, you know, do some, do some new work essentially with people over, over kind of like this kind of thing or and then also the mix and stuff I had to get done so it's been good just kind of seeing that the next few weeks is it's like busy and it's varied rather than just like right you are on lockdown on your own mixing for the next indefinite period. So Gethin I read that you grew up listening to your father playing bluegrass. Yeah 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 so yeah, you know, that like traditional Welsh bluegrass. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, what's your first musical memory? Or what's 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 Geffen's first sort of musical impact of memory? I kind of just say, like, so my dad would always just be there playing a guitar. Like, no matter what was happening, he'd be like, whether whatever was TV was playing, my mum would be watching TV, he'd be in the corner playing guitar or watching it. It was kind of just fast. It was just always, always there, you know, like this background music always and um 
Yeah, so it was quite funny actually because when I started uh, going out with my now wife, like I would just pick up a guitar and start playing it in the living room at, at her house, and they would all be looking at me like, "What are you doing? What? Why are you? Just, you know?" <laughs> so it's kind of funny, like how you know I was like, "What? This? You don't just like always have music going on, type of thing." So yeah, that was quite funny. Going to America. Um, uh, then my parents saving up to go to a trip to America to like go to these bluegrass festivals and we like they hired this like camper van thing and we were going around and they ended up with like this uh, bluegrass legend called Doc Watson and like my dad tracking down where this guy lived and just knocking on his door and, like and this guy was like bluegrass legend blind and uh, this blind guy, and then we, my dad just knocks on his door. He's like, "Hey, my name is Graham Pierce. I'm a fan. I've come from Wales to meet you." And he's like, "Come on in." Type of thing. And me and my brother just running around this guy's garden. Like I must have been, I don't know, like eight or something. My brother was four, and so yeah, kind of vague memories of that as well. And then I think the first thing was that the first Stereophonics record when that came out. I was young teens then, and I and I it was like, you know, it felt lo- it felt like something was happening you know locally type of thing I and I got into that I remember saying to my dad oh can you show me a few uh, so, uh just a few chords on the guitar really and he showed me just a few basics of that and you know I, I just wanted to get to songwriting <laughs> kind of thing I didn't you know you'd be like oh but now you can do this technique I was like no 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 no, no. I just want to I just want to write songs now that's great I've got these four chords that's me now put a capo on and I'm sorted for life <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, so yeah, so that was, yeah, and then I kind of got into like heavier music and uh, like, um, yeah, heavier stuff. And then my first band actually was like quite a scream, screamy, shouty, heavy band. So I, I was a, a singer in that band. That was, that was fun, type of thing. So did that for a few years, which led me into, you know, played lots of shows of that and, you know, meeting other bands. And also, like, they were my first studio experiences then were, were going into studios with that band. And it was quite interesting. It's like, I still always think about those experiences now when I, because we were there, we'd pay like our £200 a day to go in the studio to record four tracks, you know, something crazy like that. And the people who you were working with, like, they didn't really care. They just wanted you in and out. Yeah. And it's kind of, I, I still always have that feeling you know, when I go in to try and remember, like, to you know, especially younger bands who maybe it's their first experience in a studio, like, try and remember that feeling of, like, you know, you you give it, you, you're wait, almost looking for the answer from this person, to, you know, type of things. Like, and I always try making a point of saying everything I work on with everyone, I'm always like, look, it's not my record. It's not a Geth and Pearson record. It's, this is you. This is your rock record. This is your song. It's like... You know, this thing, it, my, my job's to kind of help you be the ultimate version of you type of thing or a version you didn't even know you could be. I'm just interested to find out what you think the difference is between working with a solo artist one-on-one mm-hmm. and with a band of, say, four or five members. So with a, a solo artist, um, it's quite interesting, actually, because, like, I've just done a record with one solo artist and like they, they were kind of like, I just wish I had a band to take this pre- to share the pressure, sort of thing, you know. And then sometimes you work with someone in a band, and they'll be like, you know, this would be so much easier if I could just do this on my own, you know, sort of thing. It's like the grass is always they're all, the grass is always greener, I guess. I've worked with bands sometimes where the dynamic is it's like competitive. They're like competitive siblings almost, you know. It's kind of where they they almost feel like rather than it's about trying to make them focus on the goal, the ultimate goal, rather than whose opinion is right, you know, type of thing. So, like, you'll have that thing in the room where they're like, no, I think this is the right way, I think this is the right way. And you're kind of like, guys, at the mat, you know, let's, let's take a step back from this. At the moment, you're not, you're not actually discussing what is best for what we're doing. You're just kind of, it's a power struggle at the moment. So you then so become like, almost like a mediator as well as a producer. Yeah, yeah, kind of a thing of like, look, oh, you know, let's just try both these ideas out and, I've, you know, and show an impartial ear maybe because rather than it being about, you know, who was right, who was wrong. Yeah, and also I think um, the dynamic in the studio is such a small space. You you, you said once uh, instead of doing a sound degree course uh, to go and do a degree in psychology to be uh, yeah. prepared for a, a job as a producer. But you totally. work out the characters fairly quickly, don't you? That's part of the job. You have yeah. to out where the power is and what the dynamic is inside the band. 
I used to teach like you know, primary school te- and it's like you know I see them it's almost like oh I've got a new class right let's work out the personalities of they're going to be the troublemaker they're the one who's always shouting everyone else down they're the one who's like you know the quiet wild card who needs to be given some time type of thing you know and it's like oh they're the one who's just going to be plasticine all day <laughs> you know it's like I need, I, I'll need to keep an eye on that one <laughs> like I said you know, you can do a sound sound course and like not see a studio or not see anyone for four years and write about it. Or you can like go out there and learn how to interact with people and get the best out of people. Ultimately, it's kind of like I you know said earlier. It's not it's not about me and my record. It's just about what I can do to help them get the best out of what they've got and the time they've got. You know, Gethin, you you wear so many different hats. You're a songwriter. You're an engineer. You're a music programmer. You're an instrumentalist. You're a mixing engineer. If you were to choose one of these roles, if you were to choose one hat over the others, what what would you choose and why? Oh, I don't. I I think they all inform each other. It's hard. It'd have to be like a multi jester hat made of all of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> so I always find mixing stuff I've produced the hardest um, whereas when I've when I haven't produced it and you're given oh this is it do do you type of thing I always find that you know I, I find those mixes for so I don't know why I always feel like they, they've I don't know I've, I've done more maybe yeah. but um but I yeah I couldn't choose I don't think what which one I would just if I had to do one, because like I said, it's kind of, I look after, a, uh, you know, a studio session, being around people for a while, I look forward to getting back and having a bit of kind of, you know, chill time, alone time, kind of not having to deal, you know, there's so many, pr- yeah, pressures, I guess, and kind of things always whizzing around when, when you, you know, and making sure everyone's like at their best, everyone's happy, everyone's, you know, ready to, ready to go when they can come back and mix. It's like right now I can kind of just, I don't have to worry about all these personalities every day. And also feeling like you're kind of, you know, on every day as yeah. well, you know, it's kind yeah. of, so, yeah, but, yeah. So I think it's about, you know, being able to oh, get the, the balance of them all is, is the, is the trick. And do you see the mastering process as like the final mix, the polish, polishing the stone? How, yeah, how so like I kind of, um, so like I've kind of described it as um, some people have been like, oh, there's this guy who can master our stuff. And he's like, he's going to do it for like 20 pounds. He's just downloaded these like plugins. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. So let's just, you've spent four or 500 pounds a day in a studio. You've paid, you know, for production. You've paid for this mix. You've put a lot into this. And now you're just going to like, chuck someone 20 pound to finish it it's like just to like crush the hell out of it it's kind of like i guess i say it's kind of like you, you know you wouldn't spend millions and millions on like a piece of art at auction and then go to ikea for a clip frame for it <laughs> Good you know what i mean it's, it's kind of the same thing it's like well you've just like created this amazing piece of art and now you've put a plastic frame on it it's kind of like no you want to get the best frame to, for the up for, for the piece of music you know so it's kind of that's how I kind of when I explain it especially like newer artists or ones who are like oh yeah but you know I haven't got the budget for mastering it's like you have trust me type Find of it. thing is Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, the difference between sort of regular production with a band or whatever and specifically vocal production because uh, you've done vocal production on Charlie XCX's official album Mm. and it's quite a different headspace isn't it um producing vocals on a track that's already been written and produced by somebody yeah it's about first of all it's like creating the setup the scene for them to you know to give their best feel comfortable just to kind of again take you want to almost just make them feel just as comfortable as possible to give to give their best so for example i i'm on i'm on a record at the moment and I said, the thing was, oh, I just love sitting down type of thing. I was like, well, you know, have you ever sat down on a session? Like, oh, no. They always set me up in like the big the big room, like standing there. I was like, well, surely the first thing we should do is like you should be singing, sitting down. So we created like in the window, put loads of lights, put loads of candles, put loads of like pillows and stuff. Or obviously not the candles next to the pillows, but like and loads of fairy lights, and you know, it was it's in an old chapel, so it was like in an archway, and it, and just we just did it in the control room together, the vocals like both on headphones, 
and it was it was a quick win really because it was kind of they were just like they didn't feel like they were being set up to go oh it's vocal time now quick guys guys it's vocal time it was just not like oh look, i'm just gonna go sing my song a few times to see how it feels and that's what you want to get you want to get that natural performance from the singer so that you actually it's almost like you catch them when they're not looking yeah, of course. Yeah, it's like I bet it's like the you know the photograph and it, it, like that's not all staged and kind of it's you know that quick glance you know it's kind of, yeah. So but setting the scene of that and finding so I'll do a lot of things where like we'll just record it on loop each section like a few times on loop rather than them overthinking. By the time you know that that section ends, they go back around again. They go back around again. And they can just like fall into an almost like the mantra of it rather than. You know, we'll do a few from top to bottom just to get in the zone, get the energy right, and then we'll just zone in on a few se- sections. Like the actual performance time isn't usually that long. It's about you know just capturing moments or like tight, t- you know, not even doing the whole song at once. Kind of getting, if, especially if you're across. It's different if you've only got a day with someone, but if you know you're away on a session, you've got a while on a record. Kind of just taking little snapshots of it, and then I do a lot of then it'll be going through it and just trying to find the best, the best ear in their voice, you know, across a phrase. So like that comp when it's put together, it's like you know, it's mm-hmm. like it was, you know, it's like God's in the room. <laughs> and you've worked with some amazing singers. I mean, Badly Drawn Boy, you've just been working on his latest album. That must have been an incredible yeah. uh, production experience. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, yeah. You know, I went to see him. He showed me some ideas. We chatted. And then he was like, oh, let's just get in and try something out. So we had three days in the studio together, um, trying some bits out and, uh, you know, work, working each other out, really. And then he was like, okay, let's try 10 days together now, working on that. So we did another 10 days. And then it was, let's do another two weeks type of thing, you know, and until and Pretty we just well. kept going back and forth. Amazing. Yeah, so I just wanted him to enjoy making re- making a record type of thing like it had been so long since he had made a record and you know he'd been through some things which you know he, he he openly talks about and it was kind of just making him excited about making music again and mm. kind of yeah embracing it and you know yeah uh, so it was really it was it was you know and we've come out of it like really like great friends as well we got each other through that record <laughs> So what are your top tips for working remotely with artists? First of all, working remote, not putting too much expectation of what you're going to get at the end of it. In terms of, you know, like if you're in a, like, so if on a typical writing session day, you kind you know, you, you meet up like 11 and by six, seven, you want a kind of rough demo, a decent enough demo to show people. You might not be able to do that over the, you know, working remote, depending on what each other's setups are. So I guess tip would be take don't uh, put too much expectation on what you're going to get out of it type of just see and don't be afraid to be like oh look let's you know to chunk it up as well in in terms of being able to not always feel like you need to be waiting for someone to do something on the other side kind of being able the same way you would go maybe for a coffee break or a walk if you were in the studio we you know do that as well oh, so idea. we would do it. Yeah, yeah. So we were doing that quite a bit. We'd be like, oh, okay, great. I'm going to go get a coffee now. Log off. Okay, I'll call you back in 15 minutes. 15 minutes. And then, ah, like, oh, well, I was making a coffee. I had this idea for this section. You're like, oh, great. Okay. Yeah, so. And do they have to have a similar sort of setup to you? Like you have to have some sort of remote recording or are you happy to record it on an iPhone and just send it in? Yeah, well, that's what we would, yeah. So last week, yeah, that was, it was, it was really good fun, actually. And I was like, oh, so how, how would you record it? And, she, uh, and the artist kind of said, oh, I haven't got anything. I've just, you know, I've just recorded a voice note. So, okay, let's see how this works out. So literally did a bit of music, sent it over. They recorded the, the verse idea we had, sent it back, just put it into a session here. And it was, it was great. You were a headline producer of Project 7 last year and uh, mm-hmm. you're coming back to be our headline producer in 2020. Mm-hmm. You had an incredible year last year. You wrote and recorded four songs in three days. You probably did a few more at midnight. Yes. Fill up. Um, <laughs> what's your most memorable Project 7 moment from the uh, event last year? Oh, the third. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> the memoir, um, I loved the playbacks every night. They were really good. Just sharing and chatting about, you know, the journeys that that put, you know, people had been on on that day type of thing. You know, kind of seeing obviously that thing of the day at the start of the day there was nothing, and by like seven o'clock we're playing these 
be songs I, that I you know have been written to like really po- positive moments type of thing. It's kind of there was no, and that that was something that came out of it as well. Was like there was no, there was no like uh, there was no e- obviously everyone's got a little bit of an ego because we wouldn't be doing this otherwise but at the same time there was no no negative egos type of thing it was all positive all supportive some of my favorite moments have been in the playback where yeah. there's that pause after a song has been played and you just go wow that's incredible that's just been written today you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, Gethin, I'm going to fire some quick questions at you just to finish off okay you have okay. to answer which one you prefer Okay. Dog or cat? Oh, I got both. Uh, <laughs> I, I won't the dog, tell them. I won't tell them. The dog likes us more. <laughs> okay, here we go. Stones or Beatles? Beatles. Ah, there's a definite answer in that one. EastEnders or Corey? Oh, just nothing. <laughs> I, don't but know EastEnders great, yeah. I don't know. I just thought you might be into them. I'm not sure. Okay, Oasis or Blur? Ah, oh, blue. Vodka or gin? Gin. Soccer or rugby? Soccer. Sugar babes or girls allowed? Uh, sugar babes, early incarnation or the about you now tune. <laughs> Thought you'd say that. City or country? Mm, uh, country. Summer or winter? I've got a daughter called Autumn, so can I just say that? <laughs> Autumn it is. <laughs> Gethin Pinson, you're a star. Thank you so much for checking in with us and uh, from the Project 7 family and all your friends. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, great to see you. Great to chat. Yeah, look forward to, to working you with you in the future and uh, yeah, good luck with everything. Yeah, thank you. For more info and to apply to one of our Project 7 songwriting retreats, visit us at project7.com.